Hi everybody and welcome to Specimens. My name is Elle and I'm the host of this podcast. If you haven't joined us before, then welcome. In this podcast, I speak with the stewards of conservation, all of those that work with specimens in some way and the ways that they feel that their work helps lead to the preservation of our planet and the species that live on it. I'm thrilled to say that today's guest is Mariana de Giacomo, the Natural History Conservator at the Yale Peabody Museum and Chair of the Shared Conservation Laboratory at Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. Mariana gives such an impassioned interview and in every word that she says and all of her endeavours online, she's just filled with so much enthusiasm for her subject. I know you're going to fall in love with her. I really hope you enjoy the episode and don't forget to find her, follow her and support her. All the links are at the end of the show. Mariana, it's great to have you here on the podcast. Thank you for joining me. How are you and where are you at the moment? Oh, hi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am currently at the Yale Peabody Museum during a renovation, so hopefully we won't hear any bangs. <laughs> That's fine. The bangs are welcome because it's all the good stuff. So, <laughs> Before we get into the work that you're doing today um, at the museum, tell me a little bit about your background. Tell me where you grew up and how that environment impacted you. Sure. So um, I grew up, I was born and raised in Uruguay in South America. Mm -hmm. So um, I was born there, uh, had my childhood there, everything. (laughs) Um, And um, when I was a kid, I I always loved animals. I always loved um, not necessarily the natural world as is conceived by a lot of people because I, I didn't have that experience of, you know, going into the mountains mm-hmm. or any of that because we don't have any mountains in Uruguay. <laughs> but um, I did go to the beach and collected, uh, you know, shells with my grandmother and we would go on vacation sometimes um, a little closer to, to the beach area, a little further from the capital city. And, you know, it would be green. Mm-hmm. And so I, I always, that and I, I had one episode once this is a crazy <laughs> thing when I was at home and my mom came and she saw me I was a little little kid like a toddler <laughs> and pulling my dog's head and she was like what are you doing and I'm like I just want to see what's inside <laughs> I feel like you're speaking my language <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> Yeah, I had that inclination since I was a, a little kid. So curiosity led. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and so um, yeah, I did my uh, you know elementary and, and high school and all of that, and, and then I did my my undergrad mm-hmm. and my masters in in Uruguay as well before I, I came to the U.S. for my PhD. Okay, and I know that your background still plays a really important role in your identity as a conservative today, and we will get more into that a little bit later, but. You said you went out into the natural world and you you had that curiosity and you were led by that. But what was it specifically that you had your intentions on professionally? Did you always know that you wanted to get into what you are doing today? Uh, Yes and no. So (laughs) um, when I was seven, Jurassic Park was Mm -hmm. everywhere. There was merchandising everywhere. And Mm -hmm. there were these magazines that came with a paper or something. I have no idea. Um, and my grandmother started buying those for my brother, who's actually mm-hmm. younger than me. So he wasn't even reading at a you know, level that was enough to you know, read the world paleontologist on it. Um, mm-hmm. And I started reading those and just devoured them. And one day mm-hmm. I went to my mom and I'm like, mom, when I grow up, I'm going to be a paleontologist. <laughs> And she had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, what? <laughs> so, yeah, it was. And, and from then on, I always had that idea and that vision. Mm-hmm. And I was very lucky that both my parents were very open to you are going to do whatever you want to do with your mm-hmm. life and not, you know, did not encase me and, no, oh, you need to do this or you need to do that. Um, so, and we had the chance to, to travel a little bit when I was younger. But also there was this museum in Uruguay. It's a tiny little museum close to the beach um, that I remember loving when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And it was all about like marine fauna. 
um, and I just loved mm-hmm. it. So I was always very close to the idea of a museum without really knowing what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so I've always wanted to be like, since I was a kid, I wanted to be a paleontologist, mm-hmm. but then life took me someplace else. And now, you know, thinking back, I'm like, I always had that love for museums mm-hmm. and in paleontology, I think was was the way for me to get to them. Yeah, absolutely. You're always treading that line. Did you, you said you had that curiosity in one of the former questions with live specimens, with live animals in your life. Did you ever go fossil hunting or bone hunting or pick up any sort of fragments other than shells when you were younger? (laughs) No, when I was a kid, because it wasn't something that was very alive in, in my, like in our family. So my mom and my dad were never people that, that would just, go into nature right like that mm-hmm. um my dad loves movies and cinema and, and mm-hmm. all of that and I've always loved watching films with him and um but we never had that and so mm-hmm. I got that like later in life sure yeah and that's kind of to bring you up to where you kind of made those academic decisions I understand that you did study uh, biology and zoology is that correct yes it is correct Tell me, tell me about the transition between the biology and zoology, which is quite broad, as I understand it, and then more shifting into that kind of primary focus of paleontology. Yeah. So when I was um, going to go to school for, for my undergrad, um, in Uruguay, there's only one place where you can study paleontology. And right, there think. are two ways for you to do that. You either go through biology or you go through geology. Right. Right. And I was like, I like animals. I like living things. I'm going to go through biology. And so back then, the the curriculum was very fixed. So you mm-hmm. only had uh, one option. So the first three years of your undergrad, everybody was doing the same classes. There was right. no way to choose classes mm-hmm. until you got to that senior year. And that is when you picked what you wanted to specialize on within biology, anywhere in biology. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I picked paleontology and Mm -hmm. I did. So I finished my, my master's with that kind of major in paleo and then I'm sorry, my undergrad. And then my master's Mm -hmm. again, there was no way to do a master's in paleontology. So for you, if you were interested in doing a master's Mm -hmm. on topics related to paleontology, You could, again, you know, choose zoology, uh, botany and geology, I believe. And so Mm -hmm. I went the the zoology side, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your PhD, because we're kind of getting into the fruition of kind of refining that skill set. Your PhD was in preservation studies. Tell me, did you get out into the field at all? We did talk about the field earlier as a youngster. What was it like getting out there professionally? Well, the the interesting thing was that actually my my life in in the field kind of ended when I did my PhD. <laughs> so when I was doing my undergrad and my master's, um, that's when I got exposed to the field. Right. Um, I was part of the of a team mm-hmm. that went to a fossil site in Uruguay called Arroyo del Vizcaíno. Mm-hmm. It's uh, an amazing site. It's a fossil bed, so there are fossils everywhere. There's no place to step that is not a fossil. It's yeah. amazing. And it was just an amazing experience, just incredible to to see it because it's under a stream. And so mm-hmm. for you to be able to do anything, you have to pump the water out. First, you have to dam the, the area. Mm-hmm. Then you have to pump the water out. Then you have to take the fish out, just try to get them in buckets. Oh my goodness. Yes, because otherwise, first they die and you don't want them to die because that makes you sad, but also because it stinks. <laughs> and so they're all, you know, trying to hide in the mud and it's disgusting. Yeah. You're trying to get and they're slippery. And so anyway. <laughs> Not um, what you signed up for. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we were getting all the fish out, doing all of that. And then you, you're carrying buckets and buckets of mud. Mm. But then the the result is this amazing fossil bed where it's thousands of fossils wow. from mega mammals from the Pleistocene. Mm-hmm. It's just incredible. It it wasn't just an incredible experience that I can 
you know, never forget. And actually that experience was what brought me to, to conservation because Mm -hmm. we were getting all those fossils out. And since they were in a stream, you know, they're waterlogged. Right. And so they were drying and we had no idea how to dry them. And as Mm -hmm. they were drying, they were cracking. And I was just going crazy. Like, what <laughs> What can I do to make this stop? <laughs> um, and one day, uh, one of our volunteers found a fossil that I, I was just in love with, which mm. is the fang from a saber-toothed cat. Gosh, wow. It was just stunning. And so she cool. found it in three pieces. And we said, okay, mm-hmm. let's wrap it so that the the – you know, evaporation of the water, it, it wouldn't dry so quickly. And so we wrapped sure. it as I started doing research on how do I preserve this and how do I glue it back together, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. And then in Uruguay, it's such a small country. Um, we couldn't find any archival adhesive. So I had to travel to Argentina to get them. It was a whole thing. Yeah. By the time I opened it, it wasn't a gazillion fragments. It was Ooh. the saddest thing. So it was actually a good thing for me to practice my <laughs> hand mm. skills in conservation because I reconstructed it. It looks beautiful today. Um, mm. But that brought me to that idea of, of, of wanting to spend time with the, with the specimen and, and trying to, to care for them. And so mm. I think that started opening my eyes into the world of conservation. Yeah. And I mean, you've, you've come so far from that, that riverbed, but I bet there are so many specimens in riverbeds around the world that are still in states of decay that might cease to exist because they don't have people like yourself getting out into the field and bringing them back for conservation. Yeah, unfortunately, um, conservation of natural history collections hasn't Mm -hmm. been uh, the most exciting topic for a lot of people. Whenever Mm -hmm. we consider conservation, we're always thinking of art um, most of the times paintings, because mm-hmm. that that's what we see sometimes in movies or um, I don't know, for some reason is it's, it's what's most known to, to people. And then, you know, next to that, it's art conservation in general. So yeah. that gets a little bit more press in a way so that people know a little bit more about that. But natural mm-hmm. history, I never even knew that was a possibility for me to do yeah. my career on. Yeah. And when you were in Argentina and and just South America generally, obviously now you're in um, the States. What was it that the industry was so small that you had to keep moving or you were just looking for something else? Well, I when I was finishing up my master's and working in this site and having Mm -hmm. so many unanswered questions, um, trying to go to the literature, trying to read a lot about conservation and trying to, to fix the problems that I saw very mm-hmm. uh, unsuccessfully, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I felt like I, I needed a change. I needed to learn. And yeah. for me to do that, I needed to go where they could teach me. Mm-hmm. And I talked to my advisor and I, I told him, you know, I have this problem. I, I want to do my PhD in this. I want mm. to learn how to preserve fossils. Yeah. And he was like, well, I have no idea about any of that. <laughs> so you're going to have to find someone else. <laughs> um, I was not I expecting really, you to say that. <laughs> well, I really appreciated that because a lot yeah. of, of academics are like, well, we'll, we'll figure it out or, or whatever. And they, mm. they don't, they have the ego, you know, of not, admitting that they don't know something sure so it was it was wonderful for Mm. me because um, I had a friend that was doing his PhD in the U.S. and he was like you have to come here that's it you have to just you know make that decision and and fly and I started googling (laughs) like (laughs) what do I do where do I go um (laughs) And, and one day I found the preservation studies program at the University of Delaware. Mm-hmm. And I just cold emailed the director of the program. <laughs> and she answered to me, like, I think that same day. I was like, whoa. Yes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. And their program had, until I came, you know, been mostly about, you know, material science and material culture and a lot of art and textiles and, and 
And so I was like, do I even mm-hmm. fit within this program? So that was my first question. Like, are you even interested in anybody trying to to start yeah. asking questions about natural history? Wow. And she was just <laughs> delighted. She was so happy. Um, and mm-hmm. and that started that journey that was absolutely amazing um, of, of, you know, five years of PhD plus that probably – year or something of me trying to to figure out how to get in and taking all the tests (laughs) and doing all the things and but it it was a lovely journey honestly that's what science needs science need people to keep asking questions you know and and making those discoveries it's a really lovely tale in a way it's quite incredible that when you were in Uruguay and you didn't have those answers it set you on the path for where you are today and so tell me about the role that you first took on after your long study of PhD uh, concluded and what kind of work you were doing then? Yeah. So before I, I tell you that, I'm going to tell you why I ended up where I am. So I was, sure. um, during my PhD, I did a fellowship of three years at the Smithsonian National mm-hmm. Museum of Natural History with mm-hmm. their conservator. And Great. it was again, an incredible experience. I learned so much. It's one of those things that they tell you, you know, you have to go do a fellowship. And sometimes you don't quite really understand what the word fellowship means. Like, what am I going to be doing? And it's still hard to explain what a fellowship is, but (laughs) (laughs) if if there was a good fellowship, mine was like, that is how you should do a fellowship. You know, I had uh, incredible opportunities. She would take me everywhere with her. Um, yeah. to take me to construction meetings because while I was there, the Smithsonian was renovating their dinosaur halls. Well, actually mm-hmm. their paleontology halls. And I went to all these construction meetings and I learned a lot about what it takes to renovate a museum. And mm-hmm. when I was finishing out my PhD, uh, I, uh, there was this position at the Yale Peabody Museum for a natural history conservator. And I was approached to see if I was interested and I looked mm-hmm. at it and I'm like, wait, who, me? Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> such a compliment. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that I started reading the, the job description and I'm like, yeah, I think I know how to do that. I think I know how to do that. <laughs> this one, uh, yeah. maybe? <laughs> um, yeah, and, and then I, I, I talked to, to my supervisor at the Smithsonian and I'm like, what do you think? Mm-hmm should I do this? Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, who do you think recommended you? Oh. <laughs> it sounds like she was such an integral part in nurturing your concept, you know, your conservation career. I mean, she sounds like a, an absolute babe. <laughs> oh my gosh. I absolutely love her with all my heart. Kathy Hogg's the best. Kathy. Uh, she's just, just amazing. And, um, she was just lovely and mm-hmm. and I you know whenever I still have questions I email her but I think uh, she's one of those mentors that recognizes when um you have achieved something in the sense that now she asks me questions mm-hmm. so she she is one of those mentors that not only mentors you but is able to then put you at, you know, kind of their same level right. in the sense of, of, you know, now we're both conservators at institutions. Yeah. Yeah. She's always going to know more than I know because <laughs> I've heard her, you know, once someone called her the goddess of conservation <laughs> and I agree. Yeah. So I'm never going to achieve that, but <laughs> you know, it's nice to be on that same plane. It, it's, it's so nice to, to, to have that change in, in conversation yeah. that she recognizes where, where I am. And so, yeah, I'm here at the Yale Peabody Museum. I've been here for two years um, in the middle of this crazy (laughs) renovation during COVID and everything that came. Well, I mean, you're there. I would love for you to tell me a little bit more about the kind of specific specimens that are housed housed at the faculty. What's going on there? What kind of, I haven't been, but I know obviously it's one of the oldest and largest, most famous uh, university houses of natural history in the world. Tell me and those that might not know a little bit about who's living there. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have around 14 million specimens and objects. So there are quite a few living in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have just 
beautiful collections. Um, our anthropology collections are stunning. They were moved into a new space not too long mm -hmm. ago during the renovation. And it's one of those um, storage spaces that you're always like oh, gasping, yeah. you know, just take two yeah. steps and you gasp because it's just yeah. amazing. The objects are beautiful. They're full of, of knowledge and, and, and culture. And our paleontology collections are very famous as well because um, here uh, is where O.C. Marsh was. So mm -hmm. uh, part of the Bone Wars, for some of you who are interested in, in that aspect of paleontology. And so we have a lot of super important holotypes and um, specimens that defined paleontology during the 19th century. And then we also have just beautiful collections of, you know, vertebrate zoology, invertebrate zoology, botany, paleobotany, entomology. We have a little bit of everything. We have a history of science and technology collection. Um, it's, it's just a, an amazing institution. And then we also have a Babylonian collection. So mm -hmm. it's super broad. And if anybody ever wants to do some research, I'm sure the Peabody has something to offer. Oh, yeah. It sounds like it's got something for everyone. I mean, it must just be an absolute delight to work there. What would you say is kind of like your day-to-day -day runnings? I'm imagining that you're multifaceted in the role that you do and not just set, you know, not just locked away in a laboratory. What's the kind of like day-to-day -day look like for you? I'm definitely not just a bench conservator. And I don't mean yeah. that as a bad thing. Um, there mm -hmm. are bench conservators that are incredibly talented and that can do work that is absolutely stunning. But my role is a little different. I do some mm -hmm. bench work. I do, uh, you know, repairing uh, different specimens and objects if they need stabilization and, and stuff like that. But with the renovation, my work is mostly preventive conservation. So anything okay. that prevents any issues from happening. So, for example, we have some things in the museum right now that we couldn't get mm -hmm. out during the renovation. So we emptied most of the museum, 99% of the museum has been emptied. Um, things have gone to offsite facilities and swing spaces and, and all of that. But all four floors have been emptied except for um, three skeletons that are too big to get out. <laughs> two ginormous murals that we have mm -hmm. and 11 dioramas okay. with everything inside them. So... Mm -hmm. Those specimens in, in the artwork are my main focus most of the time. So if there's mm -hmm. any demolition happening in the museum, I am there checking vibrations, checking that the murals are fine, the dioramas are fine. I'm checking relative humidity. I'm checking temperature. Um, we protected the murals with a ginormous scaffolding that the construction company designed for us and I said I want the lights to be able to turn on and off so two-thirds of the lights turn off so we're you know giving the mural some rest so there's a lot of things that um, I'm doing during the renovation to make sure that everything is safe but also it mm -hmm. has the other side you know from the exhibits what exhibits are we going to have how are those going to um to work in the new space. And so I want, right. you know, places to put silica gel to be able to control relative humidity mm. and temperature. And so there are a lot of things like which materials can go inside the cases, which materials mm -hmm. should not go inside the cases. So there's a lot of preventive stuff that I am doing nowadays um, because of renovation. Yeah, yeah. Yours, yours definitely has more of the kind of longevity and preservation aspect. So who's making, uh, do you have any say um, in the decisions for the exhibits that are going to be put together? And, and what is the objective behind them and, and you know, making them, uh, utilizing them for education? Well, the exhibits, there's an amazing exhibits team mm -hmm. and they are working with the curators right. to tell the stories that they want to tell during these exhibits. Mm -hmm. So my role is, um, initially it was mostly a planning role. So which materials can we have inside the cases? Mm -hmm. uh, what light levels can certain objects tolerate mm -hmm. and for how long? Because light is cumulative. And so if you expose something to a certain amount of light for three months, there is no way it's going to go back, right. you know? Right. So it is cumulative. So it, 
the, the initial phase was very much of a planning phase where we were trying to find, you know, little nooks for me to put silica gel mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that. Um, once the cases were designed, now what I'm doing is we are getting together, you know, from the exhibits side, we have the directors of exhibits and the mount makers, and then I come in and also the curators. And so what we do is we look at how objects and specimens are going to be positioned mm -hmm. inside the cases. Do they need a mount? Which kind of mount do they need? And so um, that is a very close work that I'm doing with exhibits and with mount making to make sure that those objects and specimens are telling the right story, mm -hmm. but in a way that is safe for that object and specimen so that more people can look at them for longer. Right, absolutely. And you did touch a little bit on uh, light specifically in that answer. But tell me a little bit about the conservation requirements specifically for fossils and bone, because obviously, I know a little bit about taxidermy restoration and the preservation of those kind of specimens. But talk to me about the specific uh, set of parameters for bone. Well, I always like to think about, well, bone is, is a material that is, it is hygroscopic in a way. So it will take moisture mm -hmm. from the air or release it. So if the, the humidity fluctuates a right. lot, you will have cracks mm -hmm, in that bone. Mm -hmm. And that is that is also the case for skin, for example, in yeah. taxidermy, uh, or for beaks and you know other keratin mm -hmm. uh, materials as well. Bone is is a noble material. Um, it's 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 very nice to work with. It allows a little bit more wiggle room than other materials. It's not as affected by light as others. It will be affected by light, though. It may, depending on the contents of mm -hmm. fats, it may yellow over time. Um, or if it came, for example, if in the case of a fossil, if it came from a site that was waterlogged, like the ones mm. that I was working on in Uruguay, it may come out of that site with that with a very dark brown color. But if you leave it in very bright light, it may bleach. So there are issues with with bone, um, but it's it's one of my favorite materials to work with by yeah. far. I, I feel like I understand bone a lot. <laughs> more than than other materials so it's, it's one of my favorite ones to work with and but I always think about conservation in a way that it's a little bit more flexible mm -hmm. maybe it's because of where I come mm -hmm. from where it's humid year-round but it's cold in the winter and hot in the summer so the the humidity and the temperature relationship play a big role in how you're going to preserve certain collections. And I, I have become very aware mm -hmm. of understanding, you know, the, the set points that you say, Oh, I need a certain relative humidity and a certain temperature. And this is how things should be mm -hmm. preserved. And I'm like, well, that is a way to preserve things. If you come from a, country or a museum that has a lot of resources and can't yes. afford to do that but at the same time uh being able to afford that does not mean that you should do it because what's the carbon footprint that you're right. leaving yeah. you know after uh trying to modify the environment so much and so i always try to think about conservation as working with those materials and the place where mm -hmm. you are so if a bone is here in New Haven, Connecticut, or if it's in Uruguay, it's, it's, we're going to treat it differently. We're not going to do the same thing, but always with the preservation of that bone in mind. Of course, absolutely. And just a quick question. Can, you talked earlier about the, the tooth, the saber tooth, and you said it was cracked and, and you know, it kept cracking and disintegrating, and then you were able to restore it and it's very beautiful. But is, it, is there ever a point that a specimen a bone specimen is is beyond repair it can happen mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. for example one of the one of the fossils that i worked on i still remember the collection number is 464 no. i still remember no. it um it came out of the site so the site you know is, it's a stream but it has contribution from an aquifer okay. constantly so you're always using this you're just trying to bomb all the water out just pump it mm -hmm. out um and the water level go, goes up and then down and up and down. And during the night, you don't have the pumps right, working because yeah. it's super loud. So that bone got wet and dry 
several times during that first year of our research. So it was like 10 days of getting wet and dry. Mm -hmm. And that made a, it was awful. So one end of the fossil kind of disintegrated. Um, we have some parts of it that we collected because we couldn't get to it. Um, so it, it was a very big femur from a ground sloth. It's really <laughs> huge, but we couldn't get to it. So we got to it like the day before we were leaving or something because it was so hard to get to that area. Mm. There was a tree that was about to fall. It was very complicated. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so that end of that fossil kind of disintegrated and it can happen mm -hmm. um, if the conditions fluctuate too much and then you have uh, a lot of cracks and then those cracks become more cracks mm -hmm. and then uh, pieces detach and they fall and they break again or you don't know mm -hmm. so a lot of things can happen to make something something that you cannot repair mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the idea conservation of especially preventive conservation is to prevent those things from happening absolutely and that's what you do so well <laughs> um I, we've talked a little bit about kind of the nitty-gritty and it's all been utterly fascinating and i'd love to talk more about it but i'm gonna have to move you on i'm afraid um so one of the ways that I kind of first came across you was uh, actually through the TikToks that you've been doing recently. And this, this definitely is like a big gear change, so I hope you won't mind. Um, but for those who haven't seen them, um, and I'm sure after this podcast, everybody were racing to your channel, but you you use humor so well. Thank you. To, well, you're, welcome, you're very welcome. Uh, to portray science in a really accessible way. Um, at what point... It just doesn't seem like you have many hours in the day free by how busy you are. At what point did you start uh, going down this route of science education and education? Um, was it when the museums were closed during the pandemic? I, I always liked science communication. Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah. From the time that I was in Uruguay, we were always doing activities with the community and visiting, you know, schools, and I even, you know, with, with my former advisor, we wrote a book for children oh, about paleontology. Yeah. It's a very short little um, booklet where you can learn about the different animals that lived in the Pleistocene in yeah. Uruguay, so I always liked science communication, always, yeah. and I started having my, you know, Instagram account and my Twitter account and just talking to people and learning from people on social media. And I started seeing this, the, the reels, the Instagram mm -hmm, reels. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is fun. This sounds like a really fun thing to do. Yeah. And I started getting my feet wet with some few little reels here and there. Some of those got, you know, more views than I had followers, <laughs> which was like, oh, wow, this is interesting. <laughs> and, and then I started really getting into mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And now I just love it. I absolutely love creating these reels because I feel like I can I can tell people what happens inside a museum mm -hmm. in a funny, silly way that can be so relatable, even though you've maybe never stepped inside a museum. Yeah, and that's you put that so well because there are a lot of people, whether it's due to kind of an economic position or a, a geographical position, might never enter into a museum. And and in order to make them more accessible, um, you know, you're breaking that fourth wall and you're bringing it into people's homes in a way that's super accessible, which kind of brings me really, really nicely to, to talking about the, your choice to use both Spanish and English languages on the captions for all of your videos. Um, you talked a little bit about community and, you know, your mentor being receptive to bringing you in and making you an equal. How important is it for you to bring, you know, your identity, uh, your background into what you do and, and making your content and your profession accessible? I, there is one thing that is never going to change. I am from Uruguay, no matter where mm -hmm. I am in the world, that is where I'm from. And there is another aspect of being an Uruguayan and having gone through tertiary education. Um, my education in Uruguay, so when I went to university and for my undergrad and mm -hmm. my master's, I did <laughs> not pay a dime. It's free. So even though now I am many, many miles, <laughs> kilometers, whichever unit you want to use away, um, mm -hmm. I still feel like like giving back. So, for example, I'm still in touch with the people from the Arroyo de Vizcaíno collection where I worked. And after I learned all the things I learned about conservation, I'm trying to 
um, help them out whenever they have questions and, you know, how to preserve that collection that is, you know, so close to my heart. Uh, but also, I just want to communicate with everybody as much as I can. And so most of my followers, so half my followers on Instagram are from Uruguay and Argentina, and the other half are from, you know, US, UK. Um, Mm -hmm. So I do have that bilingual following. So I feel like if I started doing the reels only in English, I would be excluding a lot of my followers Mm -hmm. and also alienating people that maybe are interested in museums and want to learn about what it is to work every day in a museum. But if I do this in English and maybe they don't speak the language, then I am just, you know, putting that stop to that communication from the get go. And and that enthusiasm will surely lead to more engagement and excitement from people who (laughs) again might not ever have the opportunity. And how do you believe that this is going to lead to a more secure future for natural history education and collections by you bringing that information and that content to people? What, what outreach do you think that will lead to? I hope that we can start talking about, you know, conservation, for example, of natural history. That is something that I never knew was a possibility. And even after being at the University of Delaware, where I was teaching undergrad, I I taught a class on um, natural history mm-hmm. conservation. And it was a very hands-on class, kind of like an internship style class. And many of the students will probably never go into natural history conservation, yeah, but maybe yeah. some of them will. And that was the first time that was taught at the university and I'm like, let's, let's Mm -hmm. get this out. We are not that many natural history conservators around the world. And so we need to be more. The natural history museums have crazy, huge amounts of of specimens and objects. Our numbers (laughs) are so big, but yet we don't have the conservators. And, um, there's also that, you know, if, if in the education, you never know that this is a possibility. Maybe you never want to become that mm-hmm. when you grow and, up. And that's why I'm so pleased you're speaking with me today. Um, <laughs> you've worked on some utterly incredible projects in your time at the museums and Smithsonian and in previous. What would you say at the moment? And I'll definitely have to have you back for a catch up episode, maybe in a year or so. But what's been a career highlight for you? It can be something small or something rather mammoth. Well, I think there are two things that I did Mm -hmm. um, that I'm like, oh, my goodness. So one of them (laughs) is when I was at the Smithsonian, I was one of the people checking on the nation's T-Rex. So Mm -hmm. that was such a good opportunity um, to to be close to that T-Rex and and look at it and, and just you know, touch it and photograph it and look at it uh, from every single angle. And of course, measure my arm to see how much you know, longer or shorter it was from the T-Rexes. And it's almost the same size. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that was that was an amazing experience and something that I'll always remember, you know, being part of that renovation of the Smithsonian. And then here at the Yale Peabody, I love everything that I do. Um, Mm -hmm. But there is one task that I do more or less twice a week, which is checking on both uh, murals, the age of reptiles and the age of mammals. I am absolutely in love with those paintings um, and I walk them. That's how I that's what I say is I walk the the scaffold. It's actually a ginormous protection structure (laughs) that holds them in place you know, just closed so that they have their own environment. There's no dust and there's this whole thing. Um, But you get so close to that work of art. Mm -hmm. And I know that the level of privilege is huge because visitors have never been able to look at it so close. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they won't be when we reopen either. So because there was never a platform up there uh, until now. And, and that platform is going to come mm-hmm. down so that we can put the exhibit cases. Um, so I am, I am as close to that work of art as, you know, Salinger yeah. probably when you know, he was painting it. So it's going to be um, years of just close, being just very, very close and intimate with that painting. And I am just so grateful to have that opportunity. Oh, all of the enthusiasm, passion, I can hear in every word that you (laughs) say. And it's like, I I mean, you'll have to put some pictures out after this, because we all want to see it. (laughs) We all want to get that close. And you'll have to bring us a a TikTok. And 
Mariana, what does your future look like? I'm sure there are plenty of things that you're going to get to work on and amazing specimens that are going to pass through your hands. But do you have any specific ambitions or any goals or general hopes uh, for the future of conservation or your own personal future? Well, I am a little bit of a, you know, workaholic in a way. (laughs) I absolutely love natural history so much. Mm. Um, It's hard to see me anywhere else. Um, But I I don't know exactly where I'll be in 10 years. but I hope to be working, you know, still in, in natural history. I'm in love <laughs> with my job. I, I feel super lucky to be here. And, and I, I was received with open arms, mm-hmm. which was a really, really nice thing. And I just really hope to you know, continue to be involved, uh, whether it's, you know, here at the LP body or with students or, you know, wherever life takes you. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just really want to be close to to collections. Yeah. Well, I, I have no doubt you were born to do this. You do it so, so well. And we're so excited to see how you continue with your journey. Um, Thank you. Marianne, it's been such a pleasure. But before I let you go, would you be up for doing a very quick rapid fire? Just five questions. All right. Let's do it. Okay, let's do this. Okay, so number one, what is your favorite specimen in the museum? <gasps> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, right now, probably the flying fish. If you have seen my reels, you will know the flying fish. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, we'll check it out. Okay, next one. Your favorite place on earth? Oh, wow. Um, probably, oh, wow, that's a really hard one. But it, it probably is somewhere in Uruguay, close yeah. to the beach, smelling that ocean smell. Yeah, that nostalgia taking you back to being little. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, this one's going to be difficult, I feel, for you. Okay. If you could restore any specimen that is known to be extinct, what would it be? <gasps> oh, <laughs> okay. It would probably have, I ha- I'm between, I don't know, if a dodo? Yes. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, it has to be something like that. Because mm-hmm. I think what, I mean, I love working on all extinct animals. That's why I became a paleontologist. <laughs> but I would really be super grateful if I had the chance to work on a specimen that we humans contributed in historic times right? Uh, to, you know, get extinct because it would be, like a way to apologize yes. yeah. <laughs> to the <that> specimen <laughs> from you know, humanity. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> okay, yeah. no, that's a good answer though. Um, okay, just two more and then I promise I'll let you go. Okay. Um, what do you do to de-stress? <laughs> oh, um, I like to read. I like to watch TV. I like to bake. Mm, yes. <laughs> oh, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love to bake. It's so fun. So yeah, I think nice. those three things. Okay, and finally, my last question to you. What is your favorite quality in yourself? Oh, wow. So I need to I need to bring myself up now. Uh, <laughs> it's the best place think. to end. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the fact that I am positive and flexible, mm-hmm. those two qualities I think help me a lot with mm-hmm. my work. For example, right now we're undergoing a massive mm-hmm. renovation and they want to drill everywhere and make holes <laughs> everywhere. And I could be one of those conservators that yeah. say, no, no, we're not doing that. And I, I always say the same phrase, always. And now my, my supervisor you know, jokes with me about it, that I'm not a no yeah. person. I'm a let's talk about yeah. it person. Um, some of our conversations will end in a no. But most of them will not, actually. I am flexible and I am open. And I'm positive that if we think, do things correctly and we work together, things are going to be fine. That's another one of my phrases. Everything yeah. is fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I love your positivity. And it's been the absolute light of this conversation. And your last comment there saying, you know, you're, you're really keen for everyone to work together. I'm so excited for you to bring more content to all of us because it's just a joy. Thank you so much for being on my podcast, Marianne. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This has been absolutely <laughs> fun. And, 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 and yeah, and a great opportunity to, to talk about my work and, you know, get the word out even more about conservation of natural history collections. So thank you. So there you have my episode with Mariana. She's absolutely enchanting. And I'm sure you all fell in love with her, as did I. I cannot recommend following her enough. 
Her content is beautiful, wonderful, and very well executed. Okay, so places that you can find her, she's on Twitter. Her handle is Mariana D. Giacomo. The D is just the initial. Uh, you can find her on Instagram. Her handle is Maridigi, that is M-A-R-U-D-I-G-I. Her website is marianadgiacomo.com and I will put all the links in the show notes and tag her in on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me in all of the usual places with Specimens Pod on Instagram and Twitter and I'm at LK Taxidermy on Instagram. We also have a Patreon where you can financially help to support the longevity of this podcast. I know it's an expensive time of year, but all of your support goes a really long way and I cherish it enormously. So thank you very much.